In my last video, I attempted to do the impossible by transplanting a Quadro K2000 heatsink onto a GTX 1650 to turn it into a single slot card. And well, I failed. But I was able to resurrect the card and it's now up and running. So I can finally start putting together my Xbox One S case mod. Today, we're gonna take a look at all the parts that are going inside and find out if the graphics card will uh, be one of them. Today's video is brought to you by NordPass. Are you tired of trying to remember all of your username and password combinations? Have you run out of room on your monitor for more sticky notes? NordPass's user-friendly desktop and mobile applications allow you to easily access all of your passwords on any device from wherever you are. And with their zero-knowledge architecture, your data is encrypted on your own device before it ever reaches their servers. Visit nordpass.com slash craft today to download it for free and take the hassle out of password management. That's nordpass.com slash craft. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. So I kind of announced this project back when I did the review of the A9-9820. That's the motherboard that I bought from AliExpress that supposedly contained the APU from the Xbox One S. As it turned out, uh, that was pretty much just a straight up fabrication as that had nowhere near the power of the actual Xbox One S. But my original goal for that project was to take that motherboard and transplant it back into an Xbox One S shell. And I kind of promised the case mod, but I ended up hating that motherboard. I do still have one TV in my house that doesn't have a dedicated gaming PC on it. And that's the TV here in my office. I know that's a little bit hard to believe, but I need to build one more gaming PC. Now this PC doesn't have to be immensely powerful. It just has to serve two purposes. Number one, I wanna be able to play retro games on my TV right up here. And number two, I wanna use it as a dedicated streaming PC so I can stream AAA games over to my GPD Win handheld, as well as a couple other devices that I've been testing out lately. I also have a couple of requirements that I wanna meet with this build. It has to be a small form factor because I wanna fit it into the Xbox One S and it needs to be near silent when it's not actually gaming. The small form factor was achieved in part thanks to my GTX 1650 single slot mod. As you can see, this card now only takes up a single slot, but it still runs at full speed as a GTX 1650. Now I did have a couple components on this board that I had to fix in order to make this heatsink fit. Number one is this crystal oscillator you see right here. This used to reside on the front side of the PCB. There was also a capacitor that got in the way of the heatsink that I ended up drilling a hole for. However, the hole still wasn't quite enough to get the capacitor all the way through, and I ended up breaking the leg off the capacitor. Now, I thought that capacitor was going to be the reason that this card ended up not posting. However, it actually ended up being the crystal oscillator. It came delaminated on the inside, meaning it no longer had electrical connectivity from one leg to the other. So a brand new crystal oscillator installed in place and the card fired right up. As far as how I worked around the capacitor being in the way, well, I didn't. I just cut the capacitor off and it works just fine now. As soon as the PC's together today, we'll get into some temperature and performance testing on the GTX 1650. But first off, what else is going to be going into this PC? First off, Asus was kind enough to send out an ROG Strix B460i gaming motherboard. This is an ITX board with an LGA 1200 socket, integrated IO shield, two DIMM slots, and a pair of M.2s. There's also an Intel AX200 Wi-Fi 6 card on board, meaning I won't have to have any additional cables or dongles to get internet or Bluetooth connectivity on the Xbox One S. Since we're going Intel, I decided to go with my favorite CPU from this generation in the Intel i3-10100F. This is a four core, eight threaded CPU with a 3.6 gigahertz base clock and a 4.3 gigahertz max turbo. It also only costs $95, making it a heck of a budget option. While the CPU does come with a stock cooler, the stock cooler may actually be too tall to fit inside the Xbox One S. So essentially I had two options. There's the Noctua L9i, which is a fantastic cooler from Noctua, but I wanted to give the ID Cooling IS30 a chance. This cooler is only 27 millimeters tall from the top of the processor to the top of the fan, meaning it is one of the lowest profile CPU coolers on the market. For system memory, 16 gigabytes is definitely gonna be more than enough but I didn't wanna put very fast memory in here as a lot of my kits are 4,000 megahertz and up, and that really just doesn't make sense on a B460 platform. I was originally going to go with a set of Corsair Dominators that are a couple generations old and only 2666. However, they're also too tall to fit inside the Xbox One S. 
So I ended up digging back into my archives and pulling out these V-Color modules. They're 2666 megahertz and cast latency 19, which I'm not a huge fan of, but again, on this platform, I don't think it's gonna make much of a difference. For storage, Lexar specifically asked to be included in this build with the NM610 NVMe drive. And to be honest, this drive does make a lot of sense for a build like this. It's an M.2 form factor, meaning I'm not gonna have to run additional cables or power leads for SATA drives, and it's got a one terabyte capacity with Gen 3x4 speeds. And finally, there's the power supply. And for those wondering how I'm possibly going to fit a power supply into the Xbox One S chassis, well, that's where this little bundle of wires comes in. This is a Pico ITX power supply and is capable of delivering 250 watts. Now, before all the power supply aficionados jump in, let me just say under full tilt, the system's probably gonna draw about 145 watts, meaning we are well within the efficiency curve of that 250 watt supply. And number two, for those who don't know what a Pico ITX power supply is, and there's no way it could possibly deliver 250 watts, let me just say, this is actually a DC to DC converter, meaning that we feed it 12 volt power, and all it has to do is deliver direct 12 volt power or down convert to five or 3.3 volts. Now, how do we actually feed it 12 volts at 250 watts? Well, we feed it with this, which is a 12 volt, 20 amp power supply. And I know 20 amps is only 240 watts, but again, we're gonna be more than fine. So with the introductions out of the way, what is the plan for the rest of this video? Well, we're gonna get all of the PC components together and make sure everything posts and do a little bit of testing with the 1650. In the next video, I will be doing the entire Xbox One S case mod. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss that. And without any further ado, let's get to unboxing. So here is the near final result of the GTX 1650. I still haven't taken care of the fan header, but I'll probably do that later on this afternoon. But as you can see, the heatsink is mounted up and fitting perfectly onto here. Now I do have one confession to make since the last video. Let's go ahead and get this heatsink off here real quick. Now, in the last video, I said I thought this rear capacitor was the problem as the heatsink was pressing back on it and caused a pretty significant bend. Now I did check that capacitor after that video and it did indeed break it loose where one of the legs had lifted out of the capacitor and become delaminated from the internal surface. However, that wasn't the problem with the card. The problem was the crystal oscillator and not that it mounted to the rear, but rather that I broke that when I was taking the card apart. One of the legs had become detached from inside the crystal oscillator. So although I did have a good solder bead on it, it still wasn't making contact with the board. So I got a replacement in, dropped it in place, and the card fired right up. But how did I take care of the capacitor back here? Well, I took the advice of some of the commenters on the last video, and I just removed it. And for all the people that asked, well, was it the fact that the fan wasn't plugged in? No, I did test that even before I shot the conclusion to that video. I knew that wasn't the problem. And in fact, most video cards will run without a fan plugged in, so long as the card doesn't overheat. And I stuck my finger right in the thermal paste. Awesome. A rough measurement here. Right there, perfect. And since this thermal paste was only applied this morning, I'm just gonna add a little bit extra just to make sure we fill any gaps. It occurs to me this might be the most work anyone has ever put into cooling a GTX 1650. And awesome. The pads are even making contact down inside of there. That's fantastic. Uh, so I'm gonna call this an, well, almost completed single slot GTX 1650. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and set that over here and we'll get to the motherboard. Again, this is the ROG Strix B460i Gaming. And just like I mentioned in the intro, this is a very densely packed beast of an ITX motherboard. We do have a single NVMe slot right there, as well as our X16 slot for a graphics card, four SATA ports, a USB 3.0, a couple of DIMM slots, and our LGA 1200 socket. We have a single USB 2.0 header, a front panel audio, and a three pin RGB header for addressable RGB lighting. And if we spin around to the top of the motherboard, we have a second addressable RGB header, as well as a four pin 12 volt non-addressable RGB. We've also got three fan headers and our eight pin EPS input. So just like I said, pretty feature rich board and good looking to boot. We'll go ahead and start with our NVMe drive. Go ahead and pop this cover off right here. 
Yet again, we're going to be using the Lexar NM610 NVMe drive for this. And let me see if they included an M.2 screw somewhere in the box. All right, now we can install the drive. And just like that, we've got one terabyte of NVMe Gen 3x4. Go ahead and drop our memory in here. Again, nothing special, just the V-Color 2666. It's CAS 19, which I'm not a huge fan of, but again, on this platform, I really don't think that's going to make much of a difference. Next up, the star of today's show in the i3 10100F. Again, I loved this processor when I did a quick review of it a couple of months ago. Taking a look at our ID Cooling IS30 here. Let's get this out of the box. I knew this thing was very compact, but holy crap, that is tiny. In fact, hold on one second. Now, the 10100F does come with a cooler. I'll put it right there. Not that the Intel coolers are anything to write home about, but it's still one of the smaller coolers that you can use. But look at the size difference on these things. I mean, this thing is just, it's half the height. Not only that, they crammed four heat pipes and a whole lot more fins into something that's literally half the size. Uh, well done, ID Cooling. All right, so in the box, we get brackets for AM4, AM3 on the AMD side of things. And then for the Intel, we get the 1155 brackets and uh, they'll just bolt on just like that and then bolt directly to the motherboard. And in theory, this should just drop down right on top. All right, so problem number one is it looks like this M.2 heatsink is uh, going to prevent me from mounting this cooler on. I would much rather lose the heatsink than uh, lose the IS30. So I think, sorry Asus, we're going to run without this. And hopefully that was all that I needed. Nope, those heatsink mounts can come off from the bottom as well. So, just a little modification. Oh no. Um, that functions as the heatsink for the chipset too. Um, this is why I can't have anything nice. Gosh darn it. <laughs> I'll be back. All right, every case mod is always just a little bit fun and met with some difficulty, but I didn't expect to need to modify the motherboard. Uh, so here is the stock heatsink for both the chipset as well as the M.2 slot. And luckily I had pretty much the same exact 40 millimeter standoff for this uh, just standard heatsink right here. I think we're gonna rock this, but I'm gonna need to cut off the first row of fans so I can actually mount this cooler up because it's hitting just that very first row of fins right there. That shouldn't be that big of a deal. So hopefully I'll be back in just a second with a modified heatsink that will still look stock. Now, this is going to block my M.2 slot, but there is a second M.2 on the back of the motherboard. So that should work just fine. Something like that. So hopefully that will fit now. Mount that there, put our cooler in, there we go, perfect. And I know what you're thinking, that looks horrible, and I fully agree. Luckily, there's a very easy trick for when you uh, modify metal like this. Ta-da! I'm going to go ahead and scrape off the old thermal paste while I'm at it as well. Yep, I would say that was a good move. I think instead of thermal paste, we're just going to use a thermal pad. And I am relatively certain this is not what Asus had in mind when they sent me this motherboard. But hey, that'll work. Now I can mount my CPU cooler on there. And there we go. One mounted, well, two mounted heat sinks, rather. And that is the most fan that you can fit into this board. Man, that is a tight fit. But we got it in there. All right, now let's mount the M.2 drive. All right. There we go. Good morning. It's nine o'clock, so that's cranberry juice. Uh, 
I spent pretty much all of last evening testing this thing out, and let me tell you, this is going to be one heck of a little gaming machine. Remember, the 10100F has performance about equivalent to the 7700K, and while the GTX 1650 is not the performance budget king as I once proclaimed it to be, it is still a very competent graphics card and should be able to play AAA games with ease, especially if we're only aiming for 108060 or even 72060. All of this in a package that, when all together, should draw less than 150 watts from the wall if it's at full tilt. So without further ado, let's go ahead and power this thing on, and we'll give you a little sneak peek. And of course, Windows has to apply updates before we get into today. All right, we are up and running and into hardware info here. Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple of our early temperatures. First off, our CPU is idling at just 28 degrees Celsius, which is fantastic considering the little cooler that we have on here. Both of our fans are running right around the 14 to 1500 RPM range, but honestly, you can barely hear them from where I'm at right now. Now, the graphics card fan is still being powered by the motherboard itself via this PWM header right here. I'm still working on how exactly I want to run this, whether I want the fan to be controlled by the graphics card, or if I'm happy with it being controlled by the motherboard. Honestly, I will probably custom make my own cable to have it be controlled by the motherboard. Reason being is, even though the graphics card is only set at 1500 RPM, after a 20 minute heaven benchmark, it only peaked at 82 degrees Celsius and managed to keep a 1680 megahertz boost clock. Honestly, I've been more than happy with the graphics card fan coming off of the motherboard because I get to dictate the speed on it rather than relying on the voltage control off of the card itself. I ran Unigen Heaven until the temperature on the GPU equalized so I could find out what boost clock it would be running at, and I was pretty impressed. After 20 minutes, it stabilized at around 82 degrees Celsius and still maintained a 1680 megahertz boost clock. Now, while the baseline boost clock number for the GTX 1650 is 1650 megahertz, it still managed to stay above that clock speed. With the OEM heatsink on this card, it also equalized at 82 degrees Celsius and managed a slightly higher boost clock of 1770 megahertz. However, noise was the compromise there, as it ran a heck of a lot louder. So, 1680 megahertz, 82 degrees Celsius, and a fan that's not audible even from three feet away? I think I'll chalk that up as a win. All right, so here I've got Red Dead Redemption up and running. Uh, we're running at 1080p here in a windowless border. I am gonna run with VSync enabled because if I'm streaming this, there's really no point to stream more than 60 FPS, and there's no reason to waste the extra performance that could be used to improve frame times at 60 FPS. Uh, for quality level, we have it set about one third of the way up, which I would consider medium settings in here. Although I do have the texture quality still turned on ultra because that is really what brings the most fidelity to Red Dead Redemption. Most of the other settings are either on medium or low, and I am going to go ahead and enable FXAA to give us just a little bit of anti-aliasing. So I've been playing for a little while now, and as you can see, temperature sitting right around 80 degrees Celsius. We did see a peak of 85 very briefly a little while ago, but we are sitting right around that 1680 to 1695 megahertz mark on the GTX 1650. Honestly, I am more than happy with the performance here. Like I said, we are right around medium settings for Red Dead Redemption with Ultra Textures and FXAA enabled, and we're sitting at pretty much a locked 60 FPS, maybe with drops into the low 40s, I would say, but perfectly acceptable for, you know, what's going to be an office gaming PC and also something that I can use to stream games to my GPD handhelds. And I think this is as good a place as any to wrap up this video. Hardware-wise, I am more than happy with how this is turning out so far. Uh, I fully expected this not to work, that is, putting a single slot cooler onto the 1650, but performance-wise, it's certainly holding up. Make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already, especially if you want to see the Xbox One S build in all of its glory. I'm going to be doing that in a single video coming up in just a couple of weeks. Follow me on Twitter, at Craft Computing, to keep up with daily shenanigans like this, and if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Float Plane. Links are both down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to the Discord server, where you can chat with myself and take part in the awesome community over there. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is from Crux Fermentation Project in Bend, Oregon, and I'll be honest, I bought this one just for the label. This is the Battlestar IPA.
Comes in at 7.8% and 65 IBU. A limited release from Crux Fermentation Project, the Battlestar India Pale Ale. For Battlestar, our boundless pursuit of the perfect IPA took us halfway around the globe before sending us straight out of the solar system in search of a supreme balance of hops, malt, and inspiration. Dry hopped with galaxy and mosaic hops, this galactic IPA delivers an intense tropical and citrusy flavor suitable for faster than light travel, casual projection, or just kicking back with friends here on Earth. Uh, that's a really long way of saying that this was dry hopped with galaxy and mosaic hops. And before I try this, can I just say, what an attractive looking beer that is. <laughs> wow, there's like mango and grapefruit. And Definitely very citrusy on the nose. Oh, that's good. I like this one a lot. Ooh. If they're talking about balance between malt and hops, they pretty much nailed it. Uh, this is not your typical Northwest style IPA. It's not super hop forward or like real punchy or clingy on your tongue, but it is still pop forward with a lot of the citrusy notes. Like I said, there's there's grapefruit, maybe a little mango hiding in there somewhere. And it's a real thick bodied beer. But about halfway through, it lightens up completely and actually leaves you a little bit dry, but without that, that clingy, oily residue. Uh, that's a solid beer. This reminds me a lot of one of Stone's higher end IPAs, like Fear Movie Lions and, and that kind of a series where they're a little bit bolder and a little bit more intense than the traditional Stone IPA, but this one takes it just a slightly different direction. Like I said, it's hopped forward without being too punchy, but there's also this wonderful malt that comes midway through, and then it actually leaves you with a little bit of a crisp feeling instead of, as I've said a couple of times now, coating your tongue with oils. It's a really, really wonderful beer.